Thank you. All right. So thank you very much for the invitation, and um, I will try to be quick because I have the last talk, the last uh, physics talk. This is me. The subject is still neutrinos at future lepton colliders. And um, I will begin with the poss possibly much mo most important <laughs> slide of the ent entire conference, at least of my talk, but I will not dwell on it very long. This is this one. Um, I w if you have more time at the end and you're interesting and ask me, I will explain to you why I think this is the most interesting slide of my talk and potentially of this conference. Um, so I will not really spend much time on this to save time. We all know that still neutrinos are well motivated. I stole this slide from a, a paper with Marco Drives from the Shaposhnikov model. I'm not going to talk about the new MSM. I will consider um, a minima model that has only two sterile neutrinos. This is why it's minimal. And I will um, consider the scenario where we have symmetry, uh, an extra symmetry involved to um, protect our uh, light neutrino masses from blowing up. This is to abolish this common prejudice against neutrinos that they have to be gut scale heavy or very light. Um, so, so to say that we can have them also at electric scale where we can actually see them. I'm not saying it's the case, but it's a possibility. Um, this list does not try, um, aspire to be complete, so if your name is not on it, don't feel offended. And in fact, I added one name yesterday because it was a very nice talk, um, also on neutrinos. And um, this is the outline more or less. And the first um, bullet point, which is actually a wedge, I've um, shown to you in um, Paris last year. And today I'm going to talk about um, the realization of a direct neutrino um, instead of unitarity effect, but I'm going to consider unitarity-like violation effects, which are called indirect effects on the precision observables, um, but also other signal channels, namely if you can see neutrinos at the z-pole in direct searches, um, at the WW threshold or in Higgs boson branching ratios. There are more, but um, the time has only been enough for these. And I was not giving you any signal studies. Um, I'm only going to talk about signal um, sensitivity so that we have a, a benchmark um, how much down in parameter space we can extend our searches. And in um, this talk in particular, I will assume that the neutrinos are light enough to be produced, and uh, with one exception, but I will come back to that later. I will present pre present bounds on precision data, something for Alessandro, I have the Stealthy um, reference there. And um, then we have um, the sensitivity outlook for the FCCE. And who's interested in, in the backup, I have the other two collider options also. So in this particular CSOM model I'm going to talk about, um, we have, as I said, a particular symmetry. I will not go into the details. Um, suffice it to say that the um, leptonic mixing matrix has a very specific, fo specific form. This part up here is the, the effective low energy P M and S matrix, the one that is non-unitary because of the extra um, parts here. And a very important parameter, the most important parameter is this mixing parameter. You can identify it with, uh, with an angle, of the sinus of an angle if you want. This is your cover coupling, and, are, and this is the neutrino mass. We have only one mass scale, they are mass degenerate. You can imagine it um, or read it as an inverse CSOM model. So it's not exactly the same, but it's similar. Um, if you um, introduce this model, you have automatic mixing with the light, light left-handed neutrinos, and um, I've wrote down here for you the charged neutral um, currents and your carbon interactions. These are all the, in highlighted in blue are the coupling parameters. They are essentially um, linear dependent on the theta parameters on the mixing angle. So all of these are very much suppressed compared to the weak um, to the weak interactions. So typically in order of, um, of a thousand squared of a thousand um, according to present bounds. And from this, it's a straightforward textbook exercise to compute the decay um, rates either of standard model particles like the charged the gauge bosons or the Higgs boson into sterile neutrinos and the light neutrino, or in this case, in the two heavy neutrinos, or the other way around if they're heavy enough into gauge bosons or a Higgs boson plus a neutrino. This is a very interesting signature, but we have not really had time to study that yet. Um, this is the promised reference on the Delphi collaboration, but I should uh, mention the other um, experiments at this point also because they also conducted such searches. Um, this was a direct search at the Z pole. Um, the signature was to monojet plus missing energy. So we have a W here that decays. Uh, so, sorry, I should start at the beginning. We produce a Z on the, on, the, on the resonance at the pole that decays into light and heavy neutrino. And the heavy neutrino decays into a W, potentially also in a, in a Z, but a Z boson we cannot really see that easily. But a W can decay into a hadronic jet. And then we have missing energy with the neutrino. Sorry, or we have a lepton too. So it depends on what you want to do. They looked at everything at Delphi. They, they, they did a very clever and extensive res, uh, uh, line of research. And it was inconclusive, so they considered it as an um, um, exclusion constraint. So this is the sensitivity bound that is set. Um, 
it's actually on this picture is a little um, worse than what I have. It should be 10 to the minus 5. Maybe I took, took the uh, wrong picture. Um, but it, as I said, I got null results, and you can um, in, invert this into a, into a lower bound, an exclusion contour from Delphi. And at this point, um, I mentioned this, this work that has been done by um, SSCEE group at the end of the last year. There's a similar they look for a displaced vertex. This is a very um, powerful signature, but it's also in, in some way more specific. So um, we have not considered this yet, but this is basically the same thing. So we have to just, uh, consider a lot of different signatures, some with different um, efficiencies and everything. So there's a long list of things that we have to do. As a general statement, you can say that this Delphi constraint they also consider this vertex, um, displaced vertex structure, scales with the luminosity. We have more Zs, uh, we have tighter constraints, or we have higher um, sensitivities to the coupling parameters. Another thing that has been done actually by the L3 collaboration, and I have to emphasize that we did not do this, we, but we, we reproduced this, what they did here, is to search at the WW threshold. They also had no, no result. Um, with a precision that's order 10 to the minus 2. And, um, that also gives um, constraints. However, this is only for the um, coupling to the electrons. So the, of the Yukawa couplings, you have three Yukawa couplings, or so three mixing parameters. This constraints only the one to the electron. It might be the, mo the most interesting one from my point of view, but uh, this could, I'm, I'm biased in this point. Um, what happens here is that you produce your sterile neutrino, potentially, in the T-channel W exchange, and then again it decays into a ZOW boson and a lepton. And you can search for this. Uh, these decays give you a um, contribution that looks like a standard model background, and you can look for a signal. As I said, the L3 didn't find anything. Um, we have used the LF constraints. They are compatible to standard models, so we use the, um, the arrows to get an idea how much deviation might, may be at most in order not to spoil the agreement between data and standard model. And we get, result, we get constraints or sensitivities that are almost, if you go to the same level of confidence, order of magnitude the same as, uh, order of magnitude even almost quantitatively the same. So this is a very good benchmark. This is a good check that what we are doing seems to make kind of sense. Could have been coincidence though. Um, this is a um, present indirect constraints. This is reminiscent of what I've done in uh, Paris last year. Um, this time the uh, neutrinos are below the Z-mass pole. So that means they, um, Naively, one would think that um, you will restore your unitarity and your invisible width is not any more than observable, but it's not, not, that, not that straightforward, actually. First of all, you, um, if, you, if you would work it out, you realize that the um, phase space factor comes into the picture and the unitarity is being restored if it becomes one. Next thing you realize is you have an effect from the Fermi constant. This is a te technical detail, so that will never be exactly unitary as long as the neutrino is heavier than the, than the muon mass. And then after that, you realize that your sterile neutrino might actually decay within the detector, decay products being misidentified, and then you even get the prefactor here. So it's not as straightforward as it might seem. Um, but it's in any way just one or two observables. We have a lot more. We have electric precision observers, such as said, but we have non universality. Those are very precisely measured low energy decays. Um, we have rare charge lepton flare violations, CKM unitary tests and uh, low energy measurements of the weak mixing angle. We combine all of them in a statistical fit. And this is the result. So um, depending on the mass, you get a, an upper limit. We get, it reproduce exactly the results from the non unitarity fit more or less. Um, they become a little softer be, um, below the Z pole because we lose the, some dependence on two very important observables. But it's not that dramatic. So um, the different flavor you cover couplings or mixing angles are now bounded from, from above. So the, whatever, if you have still a neutrino and it's Precision data tells us, uh, together with the MAG bound, that it must actually be very um, low, um, lightly coupled to the muon flavor. This is already a direct result that we get from the precision bound. And this is, these bounds are very interesting. I show you this in a summary plot. Uh, plot. Left is the mixing angle, right is the Yukawa coupling. All right, and their results are um, compatible if somewhat more um, stringent because they're more updated, have a bigger data set, and they are flavor de um, dependent, but uh, they're compatible, compatible to these two groups. They have done something similar. This is a straightforward result that you can get from the plot from before. Because we have, I've shown you the um, Higgs branching ratio into sterile neutrinos, or neutrinos, sterile and, and light, light and heavy one each. And we can translate these bounds from before straightforwardly into Higgs branching ratios. Um, so we see that even order one branching ratios of Higgs to sterile neutrinos are still possible, which we're actually testing at the LHC in this very narrow mass range. 
but we are testing them. And um, of course, the, uh, the inverse uh, decay is also possible, but this has to be, this is at the moment a subject to future work. Um, if you consider the Higgs branching ratios from the LHC, we only focus on the most precisely measured. We have a complication here. I won't go into this one for, uh, at the moment, so, but so we only consider at the moment, uh, for, because of this complication, the Higgs to gamma gamma. Um, precision, and from this precision we in derive a bound or a sensitivity to this the neutrino effect, and this we can translate into this red line here. This is the LHC. Sensitivity to the serial neutrino parameter space, at the moment considering only Higgs to gamma gamma. And uh, the green bound here is the like, like L3, so it's our, our bound, to the, from the WW threshold from lab data, only is sensitive to the electron flavor, and these three Blue lines here are the um, mixing of new cover couplings from the precision fit to, the, um, to this global precision fit. And in purple here is the Delphi constraint. And um, this, is, these are, this is the summary of the, of the um, present constraints. And the interesting thing, if you look at the picture, um, you see that the Yukawa couplings very, very, very well, is that most of these di direct searches appear to be more sensitive, but they they deteriorate very quickly once you reach a threshold, like the Z mass or the, this is actually the, the WW threshold here, and the electric position constraints, they grow only slowly with the mass. So that means they will, they will stay around until around 60 TB. That's what I meant with my statement, the FCCE can test sterile neutrinos of this type up to 60 TB in mass if you assume that they have Yukawa couplings of order one. That means this, this, this blue line here it's actually, it's this blue line here. This one will hit the one at 60 TV. If you assume this as a perturbative cutoff for your, for your model, then and, and you have a stern neutrino that's lighter than 60 TV and has such large recover couplings, we can see it, potentially, okay? And in fact, it might be even better than that um, because this is the, this, this, the magnitude of this line is driven by the Mach bound, the um, mutual gamma. And this, might, this will also improve before we have the FCCE. And we don't know what the fit will tell us. Maybe we, because it suppresses the, the product of these two. And it could be that it suppresses this even further. So this is a very good um, outlook if you ask me. So now we can ask ourselves what happens in the future. Well, I've already um, indicated what might come. I showed you the, statistic, the, the um, uncertainties before. We find, took them mostly from this, from this reference. We took only systematic uncertainties for the WPO. And the summary table for everything I have in the backup regarding um, the other um, observers that we used. Um, this is also from these three references, the Higgs branching ratio precisions. Um, I used the 10 years of data taking, so a full Higgs analysis, not per year, but after the, everything is done. And um, at the W boson um, threshold, at the w, we, I expect um, order 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 8 W bosons being produced. We use only the statistical uncertainties. Um, I know since uh, today and yesterday that we, the systematic and theoretical uncertainties um, for the standard model prediction of, of the order 10 to the minus 3 can, can, can be expected until, the, uh, until at the moment almost. Um, I hope we can get it better because otherwise we cannot exploit this properly. And this is how the, the, the situation will look for the FCCE. The important thing to notice here is the magnitude. We go down to 10 to the minus 10 in the direct searches. Of the um, bound from the FCCE group of the displaced vertices, they were somewhat lower, but they had a better signal, so they had less efficiency losses. Um, this is the red line again is from the Higgs searches. Everything is complementary. The blue lines are the indirect signals, and the green line again is from the W threshold, but only sensitive to um, the, the mixing of the electron. And the interesting point for me personally is this black line here, because this is the naive type 1 seesaw, where you have tiny Yukawa couplings. So that means closing in is maybe saying too much, but we're getting, we're getting closer, right? I mean, we're about to close this gap. So when we are below this thing, then we have to, then we cannot do Yukawa coupling, uh, then we cannot generate tiny neutrino masses with small Yukawa couplings in this mass range. This is then not possible anymore. So this is a very interesting um, statement in my opinion. And um, one thing I, I want to stress at this, um, for, um, on, this, on this picture is that if we have a very small um, hint for non-unitarity or a mixing in the data at um, two sigma level, it's not much, but it's there, and it's here. And if this were to be true, and if, the, if, if it is due to, we see definitely in the, in the, in the indirect 
thinks we can establish it. But if, it's an, if it happens to be due to a neutrino, still a neutrino of the, in this mass range, we will see some multiple signals. So we can kind of pin it down pretty precisely. We can already start to make model, model dependent predictions there. And uh, this is my summary and conclusion slides. Um, um, yeah, you can read it yourself. There's a lot to do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? <laughs> You're reading the last slide. Should I have read it? <laughs> Sorry. So, let me ask you a question. The other day, uh, Michelangelo made a, a summary of the phenomenology at the FCCs. And he didn't mention star neutrinos. So I asked him, why did you not talk about it? And he said, I don't want to talk about something that uh, most of the theoretical community would, would be laughing about. And so I would like to ask the question to somebody in the room, uh, why, you know, there's quite a bit of, um, how would I say, skepticism about the star neutrinos and their uh, role as uh, dark matter candidates so, uh, or as anything visible in a high energy accelerator. So I would like to you know, see, it, you know, to have a, a little bit of discussion or explanation about this so that we understand where we put our feet as, as experimenters, you know. I can maybe comment on that because I'm also new to the field and I think we had a very nice um, slide on this is a related problem from Alice, um, just now um, with the dark matter. So um, this uncertainty of the scale of the mass orders of force, maybe with the neutrinos it's not 40 orders of magnitude in both directions, but they can be everywhere. They can yes. be uh, sub-electron volt and they can be up to the gut scale in principle. So you just, you can just not pin it down. They have, it's in, a, in, a, in the end you must focus on the scenario and you must discuss it. I mean, as a, as a, from a phenomenological point of view, it makes sense because we can test them now or we would, we'll be able to test them, so you have to discuss it. But uh, nobody tells you that they must be in this mass range. They can be a lot heavier, they can be a lot lighter. Basically, we are buying a lottery ticket with a chance of 1 in 80, because we're covering only one order of magnitude. We we'll actually cover more. I mean, um, we can go up to 60 TD. So um, how many oh, yeah. are those? Well, from 10 D, even from, if you go down to the muon mass, which is where we still have indirect effects, up to 60 TV is quite, quite, a, quite a bit more than just one order. But yeah, but this is still not, not everything from the whole range that we have to cover. So we, we, for, if you want to find neutrinos, I think you have to cover a lot more than that. Right, but uh, I think it's much, much, much better than nothing. Definitely. John, do you have something to say? Well, I, I'm uh, tempted to take the advice of Thumper's father. Who's that? Thumper's father. You may not be familiar with the Disney movie Bambi. Oh, so, I see. Well, we have different references. <laughs> okay, so let me share it with you. So, so, so Bambi is this baby deer, and he has his best friend, who is a little rabbit. And Thumper's father gives him the excellent advice, if you can't think of anything good to say, better say nothing at all. That was for you, right? Yeah. So, so, translate, <laughs> so, so, so translated into French, I'm a, a sort of traditional seesaw sort of a guy. I mean, for me, sterile neutrinos probably weigh 10 to the 13 GV, and uh, they're not dark matter. They may have some cosmological role for inflation or for uh, le leptogenesis, but I'm not personally pursuing the idea that they're relevant to any accessible accelerator. I disagree. <laughs> okay. 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 And does this include the, 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 the proposed beam dump experiments at CERN and so and so? Because I thought that, that our measurement was complementary to this proposal, which is also costing a lot of money and so and so. So if there is not interest in this, <laughs> in the FCC option, it means that also in this beam dump experiment there um, is no yeah. interest. Well, I the question, then I back, uh, John. Yeah. 
this this thing st this goes this this ship is you're referring to is, is about sensitive up to yes. hear about. So this is on my slide. You kind of see it, and in this range, they are, they are indeed much more sensitive than L than in TLAP, but uh, we we have much further reach. So in this sense, they are they they are natural extension of each other. My response to this is everything the theorists have been saying about neutrinos has been uh, negated by experiments. So I'm, I'm fairly. Yeah, yeah, he was. No, he is, yes. Yeah, especially here. I, I, right. But, you know, for instance, they, we were expected to have very small mixing and they have big mixing and so on and so forth. So I think uh, one has to uh, look, uh, you know, where, wherever we can. And, uh, I remark purely personal. Okay. Okay. We can stop here. Hello, huh? ah, Alessandro. So this idea that the sterile right-handed right neutrinos should be heavy you know, came from a view about naturalness, uh, mass scales, uh, you know, who is not su well supported by you know, the discovery of supersymmetry. Uh, so, for example, Shaposhnikov uh, had uh, different ideas uh, since uh, 20 years. Uh, he's doing uh, uh, sterile neutrinos uh, since many years. Uh, and the uh, discovery of the sterile neutrino would have the additional bonus that Ratazzi told, if it is discovered, I will quit physics. This has been filmed. Okay, this film then we will send to Ricardo tonight. Is that a diminishing <laughs> yeah. picture?